So good morning, everybody. Uh, so the work, as just mentioned, concerns the creation of a agent-based model to simulate the Balkan Olympic expansion. I'm a PhD student at the Ecole Pratique de Hautetude, and I'm working in a lab of the National Center of Scientific Research. And the project is founded by the by the Marie Curie Action Fellowship, and is a part of the project bridging the European and the Olympic. So. I don't know how to advance. Sorry. Um, did you plug it in? Oh. Makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to start with a theoretical frame about historical agent based modeling in general. Then I will describe the archaeological data that I used and then the functioning of the agent based model and how I built it. So I'm going to start with the theoretical frame. So I'm trying to explain why, in my opinion, agent-based models in historical modeling can be a powerful and useful instrument, and they can be used in to better understand the past. So the history can be seen as the flow of human activities through the time. However, as you can see in this picture, or well, as you can see, since it's not very clear, is that it's not easy to do that. It's not easy to model the history. One of the reasons is that uh, historical modeling as a problem represented by stochasticity and contingency. The stochasticity is the random variation of phenomena, while the contingency is the unpredictability of their succession. However, the historian Fernand Brodel suggested a division of history in three periods of different duration. It's the so-called spectral decomposition of history. And those three periods are long duration, medium duration, and short duration, and they can help us to understand why actually historical modeling is feasible and can be done. So I will start from the short duration of history that's represented by those red dots, and it concerns the evenimental history, so the events. For example, the birth of an important person, or a war, the event that triggers a war or a battle. And while well, history is full of events, but when we, those are obviously unpredictable, but when we do historical modeling, that's not what we try to simulate. Then there is the medium duration, also called the conjuncture, and it's represented by that orange waves. And an example of medium duration of history can be economic or demographic cycles. And even if it's possible to detect some trends, there are still many fluctuations. However, that's still not what we try to model when we do historical agent-based modeling. What we are interested in is the long duration of history. The long duration of history uh, corresponds to the geohistory and is determined by elements such as the climate, the geography, the soil fertility, the relief. And those are the elements that influence the creation of social and economic infrastructures using a Marxist term. So, and we can see that in that long duration of history, the stochasticity and the contingency, hence the unpredictability, is reduced to a minimum level. And what is tried to be simulated here is one of that long durations of history, is in particular the long duration of the geohistory that uh, determines the creation of a particular infrastructure that influences the way of life and the the mode of life and the way of settlement, that is the farming system. In particular, the farming system of uh, the early Neolithic farmers in the Balkans. So I will describe now the archaeological data that is very important both for building the model, since a lot of parameters actually are inferred from archaeological data, and also this, some parts of the structure of the model are based on archaeological data, but it will also be used uh, in future for, the, for analyzing the results of the simulation and for validating the analysis, the results. So in order to do that, a database, a geographical database was built. The database includes nearly 1,000 georeferenced sites. And unfortunately, many of those sites are just surveys, so there is no C14 dating available for those sites. But still, having a general cultural attribution of those sites 
it's possible to find a periodization, a general periodization of the spread of the early Neolithic in the Balkans. So, well, assuming that that the Neolithic came to Europe through the Western Anatolia, the whole the sites that we can find in Europe are those in, in this area. So the majority of the sites are situated here in Thessaly, but there are also some sites, for example, here in Southern Macedonia or in Thrace. And so we can assume that this is the starting area of the Neolithic expansion in the Balkans. Then in the following period, we can see actually that the spread was really, really fast. In a few centuries, we find some sites uh, very distant from the starting zone, for example, in the region of the Danube Gorges. So the expansion is really, really fast, but at the contrary, the density of the sites remains very low. And then in the following period, it's possible to see that the expansion, the pace of expansion decreases, it's slower, but at the contrary, this starts to be a very important densification of Neolithic sites in the whole area. And in the final period of the early Neolithic in the Balkans, we can see that the expansion is very, very slow, there is almost no expansion, and there is just uh, the continuing, the, the process of densification continues. And this is one of the level of analysis, but anyway, even if many of the sites are just surveys, it was still possible to build a quite big um, C radiocarbon database. However, well, the C14 dates are very, very debated for what concerns the early Neolithic in the Balkan. So it was necessary to perform an audit in order to include old and suspicious dates. So basically, keeping only the dates that are widely accepted by the metrological community. Uh, in this way, some statistical analysis, such as the Krijgen technique of spatial interpolation, can be applied in order to try to have a possible interpretation of the path and the timing of the Neolithic spread. So this is just an example. Those are isochrons, so they determine the period. This is the oldest area, while well, this is the more recent. And for example, one thing that can be inferred from this map is that apparently the spread was much faster through this corridor to reach the Danube Gorges area uh, earlier than other zones that are apparently closer. Well, now I will describe the, the core of my work, that is the agent-based model. So the agent that was chosen to, to represent is a household. In fact, the household is the basic unity that can be found in archaeological evidence. And in this specific case of early Neolithic in the Balkans, the household appears to correspond to a nuclear family. Uh, in fact, the archaeological evidences, such as the very small size of the houses, suggest that the houses were occupied by nuclear families. They are too small to suggest the idea that they were occupied by extended families. So this is uh, our starting hypothesis, is that the houses host only one nuclear family. Then, one of the peculiarities of agent based models is that they can work with partial intermediate models. And one of the partial intermediate models concerns the economic infrastructure. So, essentially, it was modeled the functioning of an intensive farming system, according to some reconstructions. So that means that the agents, they do agriculture, they are agricultures, they do agriculture, and they also own herds of domesticated animals. The animals are cattle, uh, sheep and goats, and pigs. And those animals are not only used for food, because they are food, but also because they are, they are exploited for manuring. Uh, so they are really an active part of the farming system. Then agents can also complete their alimentation hunting and gathering water resources. Then, another partial intermediate model concerns the demography. So, essentially there is mortality and fertility according to pre-industrial life parameters. That means that individuals within houses can die uh, or reproduce. And also, they can marry, and the marriage, in this case, corresponds to the creation of a new household. In fact, as I said before, a household is a nuclear family, so the marriage corresponds to the creation uh, of a new nuclear family and therefore of a new household. And the new household can actually correspond to a densification of the already occupied settlement or to a new colonization. That depends on the local density. And the local density actually is just an expression of the scalar stress. The scalar stress is the reduction of the consensus due to the depression of the population. 
So to try to explain that differently, after a certain soil, it will be not likely that the new hazel will be accepted in the settlement because a large population will cause tension and scholar stress. So the new hazel will be more likely to live and to go to colonize a new area. And another thing that was implemented in the model uh, are the climate reconstruction. They are based on the pollen side from one side. Uh, I was chosen the side of Tenagi Filippo because we have seasonal precipitation and temperature reconstruction for the period that we are interested in. And then the climate variation of the last 50 years in the Balkans, in the whole region, are obtained from the World Climate Database. In this way, the original data from Tenagi is adapted to the entire Balkan region. So it's possible to have an estimation of the, the temperature of the pre precipitation for the whole region and for the whole period of the simulation. And this is, inter is interesting because exceptionally cold or hot and dry or humid season can trigger crisis, uh, causing famines, because obviously crisis influence the farming system and then can cause famines and have consequences on the Asian behaviors. Then, also, the spatial environment was reconstructed. And the first step was to divide the whole area in pixels of one square kilometer each. So the basic unity of information for what concerns the map, the best patch map, is one square kilometer. And then every pixel has a value that represents the likelihood of it being occupied by the farmers. And that value is computed from different ge geoclimatic variables that can influence the choice of the agents. So rainfall, temperature, soil fertility, and altitude. Then those values are regressed on the dummy variable present absence. So to better explain that, basically, if on the pixel there is at the evidence of an observed site in archaeology, then those values are regressed on one. While in, in the, on that pixel there is no evidence of occupation of sites, that values are regressed on zero. So to try to show that graphically, through our maps of spring temper of seasonal temperature and variations, and then maps of uh, rem uh, seasonal rainfall and variations. Then there is a reconstruction of the soil fertility, and finally there is the relief and the actual presence of neolithic sites, as I explained just before. And all this give as a result the best patch map. The best patch map is made of standardized values that range from 0 to 1. And pixels with a value close to 1 will be represented in green. And those will be pixels that are very favorable for agriculture, so very likely to be occupied by the Neolithic farmers. While pixels with values near to 0 are not good at all for the agriculture, and so normally they will not be occupied by the farmers. So I will just go to the conclusions. In fact, the work is still in progress, and unfortunately, I have no results to show yet, but I can still try to make like, some conclusion. So like the future perspectives, so the results of the simulations will be analyzed and compared to the archaeological records in order to see which is the scenario that best fits the observed data. For example, some kind of an analysis could be based on the advance of the pioneer front, for example, using the Krajian technique as I shown before, or for, or for example, the analysis of the densification area using techniques such as the convex hole. Uh, so there are different just statistical techniques that can be used for that goal. And so just to conclude, what I think is very interesting about the agent-based modeling is that it's a very comprehensive approach because I'm using data that comes from very different uh, dis disciplines. So I'm using data from geography and from ethnography, anthropology, anthropology and climate reconstruction, soil fertility. So it's really a very comprehensive approach. We are not limited to pure archaeological observation anymore. We try to, to create new scenarios. And to, uh, in this way, <coughs> after analyzing the results, we can try to go back to the original archaeological data, trying to raise new questions and having new perspectives. Uh, that's it. Thank you.